but often in programming, we need to represent the absence of a value. This is the second video in a series of videos I'm making explaining how to use the Swift programming language. In this video, I'm gonna show you how to use optionals. So let's get started. I'm gonna create a new Swift command line project using Xcode on my Mac but you can follow along with the code examples using any system that has Swift installed on it. So I have a command line app running here and I'm just gonna start by making a really simple function called say hello. That's gonna take in a name that is a string. I'm just gonna print out hello name. So I can call this function uh, with my name or even with just uh, an empty string. Ah. And this should work, should just print out hello Sam and then hello empty. Um, so this is great and Swift is type safe, it's making sure that we can only ever pass in a string to this function. But often in programming, we need to represent the absence of a value. So I might wanna be able to call this function and pass in nothing, no string. Uh, and if I do that, in Swift anyway, and try and run this, it's gonna say I can't do that, I can't pass in nil because nil isn't a string. And in other languages like Objective-C, this was fine. If, if you set a function as expecting a string, you can pass in a string or nil, no problem. But in Swift, it's gonna be really strict about this. So we need uh, a way of telling this function that it can accept a string or nothing, right? Nil, the absence of a string. Uh, and we can do that by just adding a question mark onto the end of the type. So instead of saying this accepts a string, it's now an optional string. And this actually completely changes the type. So it's not a string anymore. It's actually an optional type that can hold the value of nil or a string. Uh, but this syntax is a little bit longer and, and less readable. Uh, so we just use the question mark after the type. Um, so this is great, I can now run my code, I can pass in a string or I can pass in nil. But now we're getting a warning because we're not printing a string anymore, we're printing an optional. And we can see this down here that every time we're saying hello Sam, it's actually hello optional Sam or hello optional string or nil when it's the absence of a string. Uh, so we don't wanna be printing out the actual optional. In this case, when I have a string, when I have Sam, I wanna take that string value out of the optional and just print that. And it's really easy to get a value out of an optional. I can just use an exclamation mark. So before I use the exclamation mark, this is an optional type and it either has a string or has nothing. Uh, but if I use the exclamation mark, it's gonna grab the string out of that optional. And this works great as long as I have a value. So hello Sam is great because Sam is a value. Uh, hello empty string, empty string is fine because it is a value. But as soon as I have a nil value, this exclamation mark actually crashes my application. And this is kind of uh, a good thing. It's uh, you can only get a value from an optional if there is a value to get. Uh, so really what we need to do here is check if name is not null or if name is not nil. Only then do we want to unwrap the name and get the value out of it, right? We can only unwrap an optional if there is a value anyway. So if it's not nil, we'll unwrap it. Else, uh, we could even print out a different message, right? Like, um, you must pass in a name. Um, there we go. So now this works great. Uh, I can pass in a name, I can pass in uh, nil, and it will work either way. Uh, one way it's a more meaningful greeting and the other way is just telling us that we need to pass in a name. So this is kind of the whole idea behind optionals. Instead of just having a type that always has to have a value, you can have a value or you can have nil, and then you can grab that value later on as long as the optional is not nil. It turns out that it's really common to have a lot of optionals in an application. In a real world application, there just happens to be a lot of times when you have the absence of a value. So there are more ways of unwrapping an optional that can make your application a little bit easier to read and a little bit easier to program with. So I can update this if statement 
and create a new variable called unwrapped name, set it equal to name. And what this will now do is check to see if there's a value in name. And if there is, unwrap that value into the variable unwrapped name. And then in this part of the if statement, it will use that value. Uh, and if there is no value, then it just goes straight to the else statement. So if I run this, the output should be exactly the same, but I'm now doing that if statement and unwrap in one go, which is uh, a little bit more handy if I'm using that variable in multiple places. Uh, another thing that's really common to do in Swift is to actually name the new variable the same name as the original optional. Uh, and this looks kind of weird. Uh, it looks like it maybe shouldn't even be allowed, but this is a really common thing to do in Swift and it's something to get used to. Uh, so basically, if I'm outside of this if block right here, then name is an optional that might have a value that's a string and it might have nil. But if I'm inside this if block, if I'm right here, name is not an optional, it's now a string. So again, if I run this, the output should be exactly the same, but we can improve on this a little bit because right now, if name does have a value and we're going down the happy path, we're already getting a level of indentation. And if we have more uh, optional values, more if statements, we're gonna get pretty deep into that indentation and it can be a little bit difficult to read. So what we can do is turn this if statement into a guard statement. Pretty much exactly the same syntax, but I'll move these things around. So again, the same logic, if I rerun this, the output's gonna be exactly the same, but now we're making sure that name has a value before we execute any of the code below the guard statement. So it kind of inverts it a little bit. If we're inside the guard statement or before the guard statement, name is an optional. But if we're anywhere after the guard statement, name is unwrapped. And this lets our happy path be less indented, easier to read, easier to reason about. So this is a really, really common thing that you're gonna see all over the place in Swift. Okay, so for my next example, I'm gonna change up the code a little bit. So now instead of just passing in an optional name, I'm passing in an entire optional struct that also might have a name, like the name is, is an optional string here. So if I pass in a user, we first have to unwrap the user, then that user might have a name, so we have to unwrap the name, and then we can print out the name. And this works in the same way again, but you can see how this might get out of hand pretty quickly. So there are uh, much better ways of doing this. One way uh, might actually be to just combine the guard statement. So what I can do is move this let down here and separate them with a comma. So first, the guard statement is going to evaluate the, the user part of this, try and unwrap the user. If that's successful, it will then move on to the next part where it unwraps the name. And if all of that's successful, then we actually get the name out of that. So this can be really, really handy. Uh, but it also leaves this user variable as an unwrapped variable that I can use and I'm not using. So this isn't the most readable code because it seems like I wanna use the user, but I'm not actually using user down here. So I can reduce the size of this and increase the readability a little bit by using something called optional chaining. So here what I'm gonna do is put a question mark immediately after the user. And basically it works like this. So if I have an object that is an optional and I wanna access a property on that object, I don't have to unwrap that object first. I can use a question mark before I add the dot syntax and then try accessing a property. So in this case, I'm trying to access the name property from the user object. So if user is nil, Swift's gonna stop right there and not continue and try and access the name. But if user is not nil, then it will actually be able to access the name property. And we can keep going with this. So name is a string, which means that I can access the length of the string using count. And because name is an optional string, I can put a question mark there, which means I don't have to unwrap that first. I can just try and access the property. And this is a really cool technique because this can be as long as I want it to be, but I don't have to unwrap each step of the way. I just put a question mark and Swift will evaluate it from left to right. And if it finds nil anywhere, it will return nil. But if it actually gets to the very end, the last value in this case count, it will return that value. But something interesting to notice here, so let's say let length equal that. So count is an int, uh, and it's not an optional int, it's just a normal int because a string will always have a length. It'll be zero or more characters long. Uh, 
But because I've used optional chaining here, the type of length is actually an int optional because anywhere along the chain, nil might get returned, right? Because if user is nil or name is nil, then we're gonna get nil as the, as the result of this. So length is now an optional int that will have nil if any of them are nil, but will actually contain the count if it manages to get through every object and access the count. So what we can do in these situations is if I want the count, or in this case, I just want the name, I can use optional chaining like this, but then use a, an if let or a guard let statement to then get that final value. So this cleans up the code a little bit and allows me to just access the name as I need to. And this doesn't just work for getting values, I can also use this technique to set values. So let's say I have this user as a variable that I happen to have set as an optional. I could set the name of this user using optional chaining. So if user was nil, nothing would happen. It would stop right there. Oh, it has to be var. So if user is nil, it's gonna stop right there and nothing's gonna happen. But if user has a value, then the name will actually be set. And again, I don't have to do any explicit unwrapping here. I can just do optional chaining, everything's taken care of. So there's one more tool I wanna to show you that can be handy in situations where you don't need this much logic. So for example, in this say hello function, you really just wanna print the user's name or maybe a different message if there is no username. And in this case, maybe we wanna print the user's name or we'll just print like a default, I don't know, anonymous user message or something. So what I can do here is after the optional, I can type two question marks and then provide some sort of default value. So if there is a name on the user, then use that name. But if there isn't, let's just use um, anonymous. So if you pass in a user, great, use the name. If you don't, you get anonymous. And there we go. So that's optionals in Swift and optionals are everywhere in the language. So it's important that you get familiar with them and that you get comfortable using them. My suggestion would be to practice all these techniques of using and unwrapping optionals. And then when you're programming, you're just gonna to have to decide which technique is best for the current situation. And you wanna try and get a, a balance of writing less code, but making your code as readable as possible. And that's where I'm gonna end this video, but stay tuned for more videos on Swift and iOS development.